So as I do many times when I preach, I want to start with some questions, which we'll put them on the screen, and uh, we'll ask ourselves these questions. Here's the first question. Am I living a successful life? Now, <clears throat> you can think about your life and ask that question. Are you living a successful life? And if not, how can I live a successful life? Number three, what is the definition of a successful life? And I believe that this last question is what many people are doing throughout the world. I think most people is, I'm just living life unaware of if what I'm doing is real success or not. I believe for the majority of people that they just, we just go through life and don't really think about life. What is life? What is a successful life? What is it that I'm supposed to be accomplishing <clears throat> in this journey that God has given to me? Now, I've shared this many times that I'm not afraid. I don't fear very, very few things in life because I know that God's got me. I'm not leaving this earth until God says nothing's coming upon my life unless God allows it. And if it does, then He'll give me the strength to get through it. So I don't, I don't fear many things, but there's one thing that I've always feared, always, and it just eats at me all the time, and that is getting old. Now, i got a long way before I get old. Y'all know that, right? But getting old... And looking back at my life and saying, what did I really accomplish that matters? What did I really do? Did I make a difference? Who did I help? And I just always, this thing just, just kind of haunts me. My thoughts is like, I don't want to get to the end. If God gives me many, many more years and think, you know what? I just wasted so much of my time on things that really don't matter. Do you ever really think about your life and say, what really matters in the things that I'm doing? You know, one day when we stand before God, do you ever think, what's he going to really say that matters? How many baskets that we could shoot in a metal hoop that's attached to a board? <laughs> How many balls we can hit, how fast we can run. I don't think none of that's going to come up when we get to the Lord. None of it. I think it's going to be something completely different when we stand before God and what really, really matters. So what I want to talk about is what does it take to be what God says is successful? And so there's two definitions of success. The world has a definition of success that most people are, they're on that path and that's what they're doing. And then God has a definition of success. So let's first look at the world's definition of success. It says, the world's definition of success is basically these things. It's having money and materialism or things, being known, prestige, fame, power, or an important position. And lastly, experiencing self-gratifying, pleasurable experiences. These things. Now, let me clarify, because I know sometimes I remember growing up and, you know, when money was talked about or materialism, all, this, all these things, it was always like, oh, it's a sin. So let me just clarify that it's not a sin or it is not bad to be blessed with money. Money is actually amoral. It's not bad and it's not good. It's just all in how you use it and all in how you view it in your life. If we don't have money as believers, and if you don't have money and I don't have money, then how do we give to the work of the Lord? How do we support our family? How do we take care of the needs and help others? How do we support missionaries and help people? So there's a good side of money. And so money can be good if understood in its right place, but the Bible also says money is a root of all evil. And there are millions of people that think that success is based off who has money. 
Now the Bible says this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. For the love of money, and that right there is the key. There's nothing wrong with earning money, making money. I know many of successful business people that are Christians that have a great deal of money, but they use their money to take care of their family, and they use it for the glory and the kingdom of Jesus Christ. But when you love money more than you love the things of God, then it becomes an idol. So for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. You know what separated families and destroyed families and destroyed people and destroyed nations, all of that, you know what it's all about? Money. So the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith. That means Christians. These were believers. Strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Oh, what's the lesson there? The love of money brings and can bring many sorrows. I'll share more about that in the weeks to come. When money is loved above God and loved above others, then it's sin. But yet we live in a world that says you're successful if you have more money than other people. Now, having nice things is not a sin. Material things are not bad in itself. Again, they are, if, if they are loved above God and others, then it's a sin. So having nice things is fine. But having nice things and the work of the Lord is not given to, and this, this happens in many people's lives, that we have to have nice things, but yet the church of Jesus Christ is in shambles. Something's wrong. If someone is living just for money and material things, God says that is not a successful life. Worshiping money and things is not success. Here's what it says in Luke chapter 12, verse 15. And he said to them, take heed. He's, here's a warning. Beware of covetousness. For one's life, your life, my life, does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. God doesn't measure you by how big your house is or how fancy of a car you drive or how much money you have in your bank account or how many gadgets you have at your house and how many things. that God doesn't measure that as His tool to say, oh, that makes you successful. He tells us here our life doesn't consist of the abundance of the things that we have. That doesn't really make a successful life at all. And actually, you, this is what you'll find. The more you have, the more pressure it is. You ever notice that? Start buying a lot of stuff. Start having stuff. It's just more stuff you got to take care of, more things you're responsible for, more time of your life you got to dedicate to it. The more you have, I, you know what I'm trying to do in life? I'm trying to get rid of everything. I don't want it to all to go away. I'm trying to figure out my exit plan. I don't want to owe nothing. And if I decide, you know what, I don't want all this pressure. I can just say, oh, I'm just going to preach across life and forget the rest. Because <laughs> the more you have, the more you worry about it, don't you? It owns you. So it's not a sin, nor is it wrong to also to be in a position of power or to be known. It's a, that's fine as long as you don't let it go to your head and you think you're somebody special. Or it's not a sin to experience pleasurable things. The wrong in these things that the world says is success in life is that when we live, these things become our sole purpose. And when these things become above God, anytime we put anything above God, it's an idol. Anytime. If you love something more than you love the Lord, it's an idol. If you dedicate more of your time to that than you do in your relationship with God, it's an idol. So the problem is, for the majority of people in this world, we've been told this is what we believe. Man, we are successful, and we are somebody, 
if we got a little money in the bank and we got materialism and we got a little power and we got a little position and we can just do a lot of pleasurable things in our life, that makes us successful. In God's definition of successful life, God doesn't include any of these things. Because we've been, the world has tricked us and deceived us into believing that if you have all these things, you can be happy. I'll talk more about that in the weeks to come too. Then why is it that people that have these things, they're not happy? So it's not true And this is why millions of people who have these things, you know, they find no contentment in their life at all. So then we come to the success that God defines. And this is the success that leads to the best life, and it leads to inner peace, and it leads to happiness. And we're going to see this when we read Joshua chapter 1. But before we do... <clears throat> I need to just take a, a pause, and I need to kind of explain what's happening. So when we start reading, you'll say, oh, okay, I know where we're at. I know what's going on. So we all know the story of Moses. Everybody knows who Moses is. Moses was the man that was called by God to go to the nation of Israel who were at that time, they were living in the bondage of Egypt as slaves. So God calls Moses to go and tell Pharaoh, set my people free. You've all saw the movie of Charleston Heston, the whole story. You know how that goes. You can read it in the book of Exodus. And God says, go get them out of the land and take them to the land that I've given them. God promise the nation of Israel land. And actually, before Moses, it was actually carved out and promised to Abraham and all of Abraham's descendants. So, just as a kind of a sidebar, let me just interject a current event. We watched the news recently just in the last two weeks. And we see that Hamas, a terrorist organization, is trying to shoot rockets into Israel. Of course, Israel defends itself, itself, and then it shoots back, and it destroys and you know, a lot of the Palestinian areas. And we looked and watched the news, and the news says all around the nation of Israel are these Arab countries or Muslim nations that they hate Israel, hate them. They, will, they don't even disguise it, but they will say right out loud that they wish they could just wipe Israel off the face of the map. They just would just totally take them out. So this war, that although it's right now, we see these little skirmishes that keep popping up all the time, and everyone tries to broker peace in the Middle East. Well, let me tell you, this has been going on over this land since way, way back thousands of years ago. And uh, if you know the story, you'll know that even going back to David and Goliath, that the 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 Palestinians are descendants of the Philistines. So Joshua just does, he's right at the the edge of the land to go in. Moses is there. But then God calls Moses home. And what he does is that he basically just taps Joshua on the shoulder and says, Joshua, you are going to now lead into the land. So they've been battling over this land since we're reading it. So I will tell you this. The Bible makes it clear that all enemies that come against the nation of Israel will fall. Because God's watching over them. And if you are a person that has anything, any knowledge or you keep up with politics... You'll notice that I watched something on the news this past week 
Well, this little skirmish that's been taking place, the, they took a poll between the Democrats and the Republicans, and the majority of the Democrat politicians, they side with the Palestinians. They want Israel to back off. They want the Palestinians to basically have the land. And so there's this push now among Democrat leaders in America to not support Israel. That would be a catastrophic mistake for America. Catastrophic. That's why when people ask me why don't I support Democrat politicians, there's one reason of many. So let me tie this whole thing, this whole story together. So Joshua is going to lead, and notice what God says now to him and what's going to have to happen and the land he mentions in this passage of Scripture. Here we go. Joshua 1, 1 through 9. After the death of Moses, Moses has passed away. The servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise. Go over this Jordan. They are on the east bank of the Jordan River. They're going to cross over the Jordan, go westward, and go towards the Mediterranean and all of that land. He says, Arise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Who gave Israel the land? God. Verse 3, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon... I have given you as I have said to Moses. Now I want you to notice that this land that they fight about right now in current events, if you read through the Old Testament, there are several places where God outlines that so far north, so far east to the Mediterranean Sea and so far south, God carved out <clears throat> this land for the nation of Israel. Verse 4. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea, which is the Mediterranean, towards the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. Yours. Now you know why they fight over it? Because God said it's theirs. Gave it to them. They're not relinquishing it. And one day Jesus is going to come back and Jesus is going to set up His reign right in that land. Verse 5. No man, this is what He tells Joshua, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Now this is the part in verse 5 when I was about 15 that I read these words and I said, this is me. I'm going to do my best to do this. And I believed it. I believed it. That's why I'm not fearful of a lot of things. I don't. Somebody say, what are you going to do if the government does such and such? Well, the government doesn't control me. What are you going to do if this happens in the economy? The economy doesn't control me. God is with me. I know that. He's the same with you. you got to know that. So he says in verse 5, Nobody will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. I was with Moses. I'll be with you. I'll not leave you. I'll not forsake you. Do you believe that? You better. You should. Verse 6. So he says, Be strong. Be of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Who did he swear it to? Abraham. Verse 7. So only be strong and very courageous, 
that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Verse 8. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. Now here's the part right here where you, you say, I don't write my Bible. Well, make a note. If you do, this is where you need to just put something big, underline it, something. So after he tells him that, he says this, For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Verse 9, Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now again, as a 15-year-old boy, I read that and I said, I got that. I got it. Now, did I always do it? Oh, no. Did I fall to the left and to the right at times? Oh, yeah. But I knew it. So here, God tells us His definition of success. Not what the world says, his definition of success. And he tells Joshua, don't be afraid to stand up for me. I, I don't understand why Christians are so spineless. Just stand up for God. I don't get all of that. I just got this kind of grit in me that just says, I live for Jesus and I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not offensive to people. I'm not ugly to people. But I tell people. Oh, Christians just kind of cower down. Never have, never will, not in me. I just stand for Jesus. I could go on with story after story after story, but we don't have time for that today. But I just like the fact that he says, don't be afraid. What are you afraid of? You say, well, if I say this, then somebody might be offended. Well, then if you don't, you've offended the Lord. And then he says, no one in verse 5 will stand before you. He says, look, don't worry about who stands in front of you. They're not going to defeat you. I'm in control. Trust me. He says, I'm there every step of the way. No, I'm there. I won't leave you, Joshua. I'm there. Do you believe that? See, I have this belief that everywhere I'm at, every day, no matter what happens, God is there. He's there all the time. Verse 6, he says, just be strong and have courage. <clears throat> you know why he kept telling him that? Because he knew he needed courage to do what God was telling him to do. And then we get to, get to the ingredients to finding true life success. Then why does he keep telling him to have courage? You know, it is very hard to stand for Jesus in a world that's against Jesus. You go to work, they don't want to hear about God. And then your kids, somehow through my mother and through going to church, I just had this toughness that said, I'll stand for Jesus whether you like it or not. Again, wasn't ugly about it. Stand tough. Be tough. Be tough for God. Because let me tell you what's going to happen, parents. Your children are going to grow up, and here soon when they get in their middle teens, it starts in middle school. They're going to either have the grit to stand for Jesus or not, because the world's going to throw everything at them. Every enticement, everything is coming. They've got to have courage to stand for God. And to know that, hey, uh, well, these people, they don't like me. I'm not popular with them. I'm not in their inner circle. I'm not in the popular group at school. I don't care. Don't need to be. That's what you have to teach your children. You have to teach your children that they ain't over here in this group, but they're over here in the group where Jesus is at. And that's where they need to be. Got to have some grit. Got to have some fire. 
Got to have some backbone to stand. And then God tells him in verse 7, Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do. You know what's wrong with Christianity today? We got a lot of listeners, but not a lot of doers. We all listen, but if you don't put it into action, it doesn't do you any good. So he says that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. What is that? Well, that's the first five books of the Bible that God, that, that all scholars credit that Moses wrote. It was, the, it was the laws that God gave Moses, the Ten Commandments, the 600 and so many laws, and all that God gave Moses to instruct the people. He said, just do these things. Don't deviate to the right, to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Verse 8. The book of the law, which is, again, what God gave to Moses, shall not depart from your mouth. That means you talk about the Word of God all the time. You know what my favorite subject is? Jesus. I told my wife, I said, have you ever noticed, I said recently, how things have changed so much. Years ago, when we would go off with friends and family, you know what our conversation, the main part of our conversation would be? It would be about church and the Lord's work. You know what I've noticed now if I go out with people, whether whatever's going on, if I would do what I can to bring up the Lord, but you know, they, they don't like to stay on that conversation. It moves on to some other conversation. I just things have changed. But it says, don't let these things that you learned that I gave my word, don't let them leave your mouth. Talk about it. But you shall meditate in it day and night. Now, we'll, weeks ahead, we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. You think about it. That you may observe to, to what? To do according to all that's written in it. Let's read it together. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So now let's summarize it. So I know you're ready to go. One, God says, be careful in our life to do. Be a doer. It comes down to be obedient to my laws, to my word, follow my word. Number two, God says, do not deviate from my word. Don't turn off his path to another road of life. And that's what we see everywhere. Christianity has deviated under the name of church, under the name of Christianity, but it's not on the Word. It's on all sorts of other social things. Social things. All these articles are written now <clears throat> that I get on my, I get all kinds of pastor stuff that people send to me. Most of it is garbage and I just delete but the, some of it is churches now that now they're preaching on the social justice gospel. Nonsense. We got one gospel, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that's what we preach. Don't deviate. Do not deviate from my word. Don't turn off his path to another road of life. Don't turn left to right. Three, God says, learn, talk, and think deeply on my word every day, every night meditate on it, and for God says, do exactly what it says. And the result is, then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Now, he don't say anything in there about cheat, lie, walk, climb over anybody's back you can, 
to get money. Does it say that? No. Does it say in there, take all the money that you earn, that I give you the ability to earn, and buy every little gadget and every little thing that you need, and don't give nothing to the work of the Lord? Does it say that? No. Does it say just work your whole life so you can be important and get in position? Nope. Don't say that. Does it say in there that, you know, hey, just live your whole life for pleasure-packed weekends and things that you want to go to do just to go have fun? Doesn't say that. It says the successful life is following the Word of God and living by it. So over the next couple of weeks, we'll dive in a little deeper. We'll see what each of these things that we just went through, exactly what they mean. And I hope, though, this stimulates you to think, because my prayer is that we ask ourselves about our own life. Am I really leading a successful life? Am I teaching my children how to live a successful life? I'll say it again. I've said it a hundred times. The greatest things that in my life that my mother ever did for me was taking me to church, taking me to church, teach me about the Lord, talk to me about the Lord. Greatest thing, success. And one day we're going to stand before God One day. And I am hoping, hoping that when I stand before God, I hear this. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Well done. To hear God say that, then I'll know that I lived a successful life. So think about your life. Don't get caught into the traps of the world. Again, it's not a sin to have money and nice things. It's not a sin to do things and have fun. But don't put it before God. Don't love it over the Lord. Put God first. Put the Word first. Follow God's Word. Don't deviate. And in the eyes of God, you will find success. This is my prayer for you and everyone in this church and for our children and for our grandchildren to be successful in their life before God. Let's bow for prayer. God, we love you. Thank you, God, for the instruction of your word. The world tells us one thing. Your word tells us something else. God, give us that courage and that strength that you just kept re-emphasizing to Joshua. We need that courage to stand tall for Jesus in a world that's against Jesus. We need to teach these things to our children, to our grandchildren. We need to show our children and our grandchildren the example of our life and what success really is. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. What's on your heart today that you need to share with God? What do you have that right now that you say, you know, I don't know what's going on with all the details of my life, but God does, and I just need to share some things with Him. So right where you're at, heads bowed, eyes closed. I just want everyone here just to take a minute, whisper, pray, Tell God what's upon your heart today. You pray.
Father, thank you for all the blessings. Forgive us of the times when we complain. Help us to find the good and be thankful. Take the people that come to this church, God, and use us in a mighty way to impact the people around us, to be difference makers, to be successful in our life. Because if we follow your word, then God, you'll use us to make an impact on the lives of others. We don't want to get to the end of life and say, what did I do for the glory of Jesus? What did I do to lead my family to Christ? What did I do to help others come to the saving knowledge of Jesus? Let's do it now. Let's invite other people to church. Let's pray for others. Let's do it now. Help us to do it now. And so, God, we want to tell you that we love you, and we're so grateful that you love us. And we thank you for this time we've had together this morning. In Jesus' name, we praise and give thanks. Amen and amen.